So now it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Katie Dietz. She did her PhD at UC Berkeley in intestinal immunology and then uh, has moved on to a postdoc at University of Utah. And she's going to tell us about host virus dynamics in tetrahymena and zebrafish. Is this on? Great. Um, OK, so I'm super excited to tell you the story about this project that I just started really in the last kind of year and a half. Um, but first, I want to talk a little bit about who I am. So my scientific journey has really kind of focused around this idea of using genetic systems in model organisms to kind of isolate and make discoveries at these host pathogen interfaces that might otherwise be hidden by sort of the complexity that is biology. Um, so this cladogram that I'm showing here um, highlights the two model organisms that have really built my scientific career as an immunologist around, um, so mice, and then these single-celled eukaryotes that are called ciliates. So the thing that I want to highlight here is that these two organisms um, share a last common ancestor roughly one and a half billion years ago. And I really point this out to actually emphasize the knowledge gap in um, how much we actually don't know about immunity, right? So we know a lot about immunity, um, kind of in this part of the cladogram here, mice, humans, zebrafish. Um, but the dirty secret is that we actually really don't know a lot about um, what kind of goes on in the rest of the world. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but first, I want to take a quick dive in one slide into my uh, thesis work. And to do that, we have to visit the small intestine of the mouse. So um, as Teresa mentioned, my PhD work was in intestinal immunity in mice. And um, I think most people are probably aware this is a pretty complex organism, right? Or organ. Um, there's a lot going on here that can make it really interesting and also really challenging to study. So um, a couple things I just want to highlight here are, A, that it's incredible that this barrier surface is maintained by a, a single layer of epithelial cells. Um, that really separate our body cavity from kind of the outside world found here in the lumen. Um, and most of my thesis work, um, I was really interested in these intestinal epithelial cells and their role in immunity. But as I mentioned, it's a little hard to really pick apart what's happening when you have so much else going on. So, right, so in this community, or in this space, we also have this incredibly diverse group of microbial communities. Um, and then on the other side, kind of my interest was in all of these immune cells, right? So we just have a lot of immunology going on at this space. Um, and I'm not going to share any details about my thesis work, except to say that um, I was able to use, um, kind of like co-opt and design this uh, genetic mouse model, where I could really pick apart um, a key immune response that I was interested in here in the intestinal epithelium. And through that, I was able to discover kind of a new pathway of how the intestinal epithelium communicates and kind of drives immune responses. Um, so moving to, my, uh, to moving to my postdoctoral work and my future research program, um, I wanted to kind of take my skills as this sort of like uh, cellular immunologist and apply that to a different uh, complex ecosystem. So I moved from the intestine of the mouse into the aquatic ecosystem. Um, so like the intestine, this is actually a very odd, like interestingly, impressively complex place. Unlike the intestine, we actually really don't know a lot about the immunology that happens here yet. Um, so again, though, we have a lot of key players in this system that I'm just going to very generally highlight, right? So we have a lot of different vertebra vertebrates, um, fish, for example. And again, we have an incredible number of microbes that we're still making a lot of discoveries about what these microbes are. Um, and then the kind of the, where I'm really interested in working in is the space in these single-celled eukaryotes. So um, a lot of our both marine and freshwater ecosystems are full of these single-celled eukaryotes, and we really don't know much about them. Um, we don't know how they become infected. We don't know with what they become infected. And we have no idea how, um, what roles they might actually play in collecting and transmitting viruses. So um, my work as a postdoc in my future research program is really focusing kind of on this interaction here that I'm highlighting between these single-celled eukaryotes and viruses um, and work that I'm not going to talk about today, also the role of these single-celled eukaryotes to actually move viruses from the water into fish. So I'm not actually going to talk about zebrafish today, sorry. Um, so, um, right, and I really want to emphasize that, like, okay, who cares about immunology and single-celled eukaryotes? Um, I do, but you should care also because, um, as I mentioned earlier, they're these really evolutionarily ancient organisms, and they're also very successful. So there are, like, thousands of species of these eukaryotes, and we, we really know nothing about how they interact with the viruses in their environment, like I said. Um, 
But as I'll talk about uh, very briefly, you know, if we can think about bacteria as a great example, we're starting to learn about um, their immune systems and how they protect themselves from viral infections. And we're finding a lot of really interesting differences and similarities to our own immune system. So I think this really highlights a cool opportunity that we have to learn a lot more about ourselves and maybe also make some discoveries where, um, like CRISPR, now we could make some new molecular tools. So that's really the motivation behind my uh, future research program. So to do this, I'm using um, a model ciliate called Tetrahymena. Um, so they are a eukaryote, right? And they kind of live in the sea of microbes, as I mentioned. Um, something that's really, I think, fascinating about them is that, uh, like most ciliates, they are constantly actually consuming these viruses, bacteria, fungi. Um, so they have this little mouth, and they're actually eating these organisms. But as I mentioned, we have no like experimental evidence of virus infection in these organisms, right? So one of the major goals of my future research program is to identify and isolate these ciliate infecting viruses. And as I mentioned, I'm an immunologist, um, so that's a really driving, driving my interest here um, to understand the antiviral immunity in these, uh, in these eukaryotes. So we know from genomic data that they have the capability of um, having some protein-based immune responses, and they might also, uh, they also harbor the ability to use uh, RNA interference as a way to fight off viruses. But again, we actually have no idea how they do this. Um, so another major goal of my future research program is to discover these antiviral responses in ciliates. And another really awesome tool that I have is the fact that there are actually hundreds of genetically diverse species of tetrahymena themselves. Um, and I actually have several of them in lab, and they all have published genomes and proteomes. So there's just this wealth of tools to do a lot of really cool comparative experiments. So something that I think is really interesting about ciliates that's important for thinking about virus discovery is they actually use a genetic code that is considered an alternative genetic code. <laughs> um, so what that means is that UAA and UAG actually code for glutamine instead of a stop codon. So I think this is really interesting, right, because we would assume that a virus that infects these cells also needs to use this genetic code, right? Um, and so that's actually how the two, only two potential ciliate, envir ciliate virus infect, ciliovirus, cilioviruses, um, ciliate infecting viruses um, have been discovered is through their use of the ciliate genetic code. So um, this was just discovered through metagenomic wastewater data. And if you apply a standard genetic code, you don't see any open reading frames. But if you apply this alternative genetic code, now you see these significant reading frames. So, I actually have uh, both of these viral sequences on plasmids in lab, and I'm currently trying to, um, oh, that's uh, there. Um, and I'm currently using in vitro transcription to launch virus replication in uh, the tetrahymena. And I think even if I can't get a consistent virus infection, there's still an opportunity to use this as an immunology tool. Um, the other thing that I've kind of been really obsessed with uh, lately are also giant viruses. So um, giant viruses are these really large DNA viruses. So they have genomes that are greater than 300 kilobases. Um, and the reason that I, I have this hypothesis that they could actually infect tetrahymena, um, because many of them encode their own tRNAs and a lot of the uh, machinery required for translation. So um, I also have a couple uh, giant viruses in the lab now. If anybody knows anyone that has them, any other ones, I, talk to me. Um, there aren't very many out there. And I think I'm, that actually makes me more excited is that um, we have a lot of metagenomic data, but we don't really yet have a great way to study giant viruses in lab um, because we don't know a lot about their hosts and we just therefore don't really know a lot about the viruses. So um, I have a couple now that I'm actively doing experiments with, but I'm always looking for more. So um, I want to talk a little bit more about giant viruses. And I just want to say that um, you can learn a lot about the history of infection by looking into the genome of organisms, right? Um, and that's because um, over the course of infection, you occasionally get these horizontal gene transfers um, where you can then find shared genes or other genetic elements um, between species. So if we look in the genome of tetrahymena, we can see these endogenous viral elements. Um, they code for like major and minor capsid proteins. Um, one example is this punitive polintovirus, which is not well studied, but it's thought to be kind of an evolutionary precursor to giant viruses. And then if we peek into the giant virus genome, uh, and the example I'm giving here is for cafeteria virus, uh, we find these tetrahymena-derived genes as well, so different like protein kinases and stuff. So um, together, these data really suggest that there is this history of infection here um, and that I just need to find it. So um, in addition to using the ciliaviruses and the giant viruses I have, I'm also really motivated to do some virus discovery because tetrahymena, I think, are a really great tool for this. 
So um, tetrahymen are actually really easy to culture from the environment. Um, and currently, I'm actually culturing cells from our zebrafish facility. So they just live in there. Um, and uh, what I do with this is kind of a long-term culture where I apply antibiotics and antifungals to really sort of make sure I'm trying to best select for cases where there are viruses in the tetrahymena. Um, so I have done some sequencing on these samples so far, and I have actually identified um, with pretty high percent identity um, several giant virus species. So I've found a couple of potential pox viruses as well as a couple uh, potential Marseille viruses. So there are a lot of sort of follow-up steps here of how you actually isolate and domesticate these viruses that you find. Um, and this is just one example of how I'm doing this. So this is kind of a something that's established in the aquatic virus field where you can take these um, virus-enriched water samples, so in my case, these con concentrated tetrahymena, um, and you can lyse them and you can apply them to lab tetrahymena. And then you can just do various like behavioral growth, et cetera, readout assays in like a 96-well plate format. Um, and so here's one piece of data I have where you can see that um, if you just look at the tetrahymena growth over time, most of the wells will just keep growing um, as they're being shaken and incubated, but every now and then I see a well that will drop out like this, um, indicating that that could be a potential lytic virus infection. So I'm currently following up on these results. I'm doing some more sequencing, and I'm also just applying Koch's postulates. So can I take whatever was in this well, homogenize it, and then continue to passage that, effect, infect other tetrahymena, and do I see the same phenotype again? So my, honestly, my largest motivation behind this virus discovery, besides the fact that it would be really awesome to find some silly infecting viruses, is that I'm an immunologist, and I, care, I, w I really want to make some discoveries here um, at this host pathogen interface. So, I want to now come back to this cladogram I showed before. Um, and I've actually added bacteria on here now to just once again kind of highlight these, these gaps in knowledge that we have, but also motivate the fact that you know, we can still make discoveries um, in these organisms that we just haven't really historically thought about for, for um, how they defend themselves against viruses. So, um, right, so we've, we have made some really awesome discoveries in the last decade or so in bacteria like restriction modification, CRISPR, et cetera. Um, and those are very different, right, from how we, for example, as humans, defend ourselves. Um, so I'm really motivated to kind of find some other differences here. Um, broadly, how am I doing that, right? So I do have some potential viruses in the lab already, um, and I'll hopefully identify some more. Um, I think the more the merrier, because then I can start to do some really interesting comparative experiments, too, between, say, an RNA virus and a giant DNA virus. Um, but then I'm al I am also taking um, approaches that don't rely on virus discovery. So um, one of those is just using, you know, what we think are probably known immunostimulatory cues. So for example, the recognition of foreign nucleic acids is probably a, 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 a what's the word I'm thinking of, conserved um, way to identify viruses in a virus infection. So um, I'm currently using, pretty, honestly, just sort of dumping all of the uh, virus-associated nucleic acid motifs I can find on these cells um, and looking for uh, various readouts that way. But I want to come back to this one more time and also just highlight that there are, despite this like um, large evolutionary distance between, say, humans and bacteria, there are actually quite a few similarities, too. Um, so for example, bacteria also use tier domains to um, communicate like the signaling cascades following an immune response. Um, we know that bacteria and mammals, for example, use these RNA helicases. There was a recent discovery of this ISG15-like, so this is an interferon-stimulated gene-15-like response in bacteria, and we know that a lot of chordates use ISG15. Um, so I'm also interested in potentially finding some similarities here as well. Um, and to do that, I've really started with a kind of a computational approach. So, so the short version of the story is that you can take um, domains from known immune effectors or Im immune proteins you can kind of create this profile, and then you can just use homology-based searches to see if you can come up with anything similar in the genome, the proteome. Um, and you can also do this now, thanks to AlphaFold, with structures as well. Um, so I've been working on that a little bit um, on and off, and I have a few potential hits, so I'll just share one here. Um, so this is a dead box helicase, DDX23, um, and it has been identified in a handful of organisms as a kind of broad antiviral response. Um, and so what I'm showing here is just a domain alignment between tetrahymena and then three other species that we all know and care about. And you can see that the domains um, really align really nicely, suggesting that this is probably a pretty conserved uh, sense, or pretty conserved protein at least. And then as I mentioned, um, thanks to AlphaFold and now FoldSeq, we can also do this by looking at structure. 
Um, so this is the first ribbon diagram I've ever generated. Um, and I'm just overlaying tetrahymena in yellow and then mouse here in maroon. And um, the gist here is that they pretty much look exactly the same. Um, so I'm pretty confident that whatever this dead box helicase is, is really conserved. And now kind of the next steps are to use the uh, genetic tools that are available in tetrahymena um, where I can make knockouts and I can do some more like genetic based queries. So I want to just come back to this in my last five seconds here and say that um, I, I think this is a really great um, interface to start learning more about the evolutionary, evolutionarily conserved and or new um, ways that hosts can defend themselves from viruses. Um, and I think like I as an immunologist really bring this unique perspective into this and in that like I can see not only the small picture in these interactions here, but I can also apply that to the bigger picture as well. And so I do have, that I'm not talking about today, um, some really cool preliminary data, like I said, on the ability of tetrahymena to actually transmit aquatic viruses into zebrafish as well. So I just briefly have to thank a lot of people. Of course, the LD lab has been phenomenal in the last year and a half I've been there. They've really taught me a lot and been a very supportive environment. Um, I have two undergrads working with me right now who are just absolutely stellar people and they've genuinely helped me become a better mentor. Um, and we have a lot of really great facilities at the University of Utah. So if you're a zebrafish person, hands down, phenomenal place. Okay, thank you. So a little bit of a selfish question. Um, do you know if these ciliates ever pick up bacteriophage? And because oh. I know, I think there's incidences in humans where like you can find phage within cells might be I don't remember but I was just wondering if they ever acquire them and then also potentially use them as sort of an immune response against bacteria oh. that they also ingest I love the idea of the immune response I had not thought about that I can tell you there is one paper and I could be wrong about this but I'm sure that I'm fairly certain there's one paper that actually shows that when bacteria or when tetrahymena specifically eat multiple bacteria, that creates kind of a microenvironment for phage to actually infect multiple cells. Yeah, so most of the work that people have done with regard to microbes and tetrahymena has been looking at bacteria. That's a cool idea with immunity, though. I like that. Really cool talk. So you said they eat viruses, mm -hmm. but Unlike, like, is, do you think the infection occurs from the eating the viruses or, like, from the surface, like, a normal eukaryotic yeah. cell? I think that's a very good question. And to be honest, I have absolutely no idea. Um, I could kind of see it going both ways. Um, so m there are, like, two papers with tetrahymena and viruses. And um, basically the idea is high CFU input, tetrahymena eat, low CFU output. So that's kind of, like, the, the level of the like research that's been done so far. Um, because, so they have these food vacuoles that contain a lot of like digestive enzymes. So the thought is that that's kind of a way to destroy viruses, but I can tell you that's not true for all of them. So short answer is it could go either way and I just don't know yet. Super exciting work, very nice talk. Um, you alluded to genetic like engineering of these things or at least editing. Are CRISPR tools worked out in these I knew someone species? was going to ask me this. Yeah. I was actually trying to read about this yesterday. Um, yeah. So again, the shorter answer is like ish. Um, tetrahymena are actually a like kind of really old genetic model system. So they've been around for a long time. Um, and, and I think people mostly still use older tools. But people are working in at least some ciliates to get CRISPR up and running. But I don't think we're quite there yet. OK. Yeah. Um, and. Presumably, the whole genome has been sequenced. Yes. How yeah. big is that, and how many genes do they have? I, I told Zoe I was going to remember this fact. It's large. It's like, I think mm. the genome is on the order of humans somewhere. It's very big. Um, the other fun fact that I didn't share is that they actually have two nuclei. So most ciliates are, have two nuclei, which makes gene editing actually a little tricky. It's hard, yeah. Yeah, so they have like a somatic genome and then, you know, the genome. Are they diploid? Uh, yes. OK, I'll stop asking questions yeah. now. <laughs> Thanks. I don't, I, I guess I don't have a specific question, but I didn't know that they basically have what you were showing with the stop code on read through. For, so they only have one stop code on? Yes. That's crazy. I don't know. I just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I guess that's all I really wanted to say. No, I mean, I, I, guess, <laughs> I guess my question, I don't know, because I was just imagining, like, I guess it's the least 
like dramatic version of a different code on usage or something because I was trying to imagine like if you could have like dual function like host specific like pathogens because when you were talking about I don't know if you could riff on that but yeah <laughs> I mean I think it's also cool can you riff on that is that what you're <laughs> did you say they told you for reading yeah That's a good question because they have, yeah. Yeah, I don't actually know. Um, I know that they have a pretty vastly different GC content, although I can't remember. I think it's a pretty low GC content also. So there are some other like kind of unique features that um, I think we're learning that this is true actually about a lot of organisms that people just haven't really studied yeah. recently. Um, so I think there is quite a bit of work. I'm actually going to a Ciliate conference in like a week and a half. Um, and I think people are, this is kind of like one of the other big areas of research is understanding how this like, using them to study how these like alternative genetic codes matter. I, so going off that, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, uh, great talk. I was wondering because uh, you were studying evolutionary history of the immune system and you also find that uh, Tetra, I mean, yeah. sorry, yeah. has a, like a, the genetically different species. And I was wondering that uh, the uh, the free uh, like there is a lot of going on of the genome size evolution of the free living versus uh, the when they are uh, the vector inside the host of the microbes. So, did you find like any uh, difference within the like uh, like what what how will it impact uh, uh, the immune system or? So you're asking if basically how the genome size could be related to what the immune system potentials are, is that what you're asking? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, so the rabbit hole that I got down on the immune system is that, um, so there are these domains called leucine-rich repeats that are used in several immune sensing, um, like TLRs, for example, if you're familiar with that, have a leucine-rich repeat. And for some reason, tetrahymena have over a thousand of them. And it's not really known why, and if that's through like gene duplication or if they all serve a purpose. Um, so again, the answer is kind of really, I don't know, but I think it might matter. Um, and hopefully I can tell you soon-ish. Stay tuned, yeah. So one last question from me. Yeah. Sorry. So if you look at the virus, do you know the, do you have the genome sequence for the viruses that you have? Um, not, well, okay, they're sitting in a file on my computer. Okay. <laughs> I was sort of so, wondering, yes. because we know like with certain viruses, like you'll, they'll utilize host factors early on right. and then switch over. So if you look at the genes, do they ha do like early genes utilize the the glutamine codons that it uses, oh. and it's not until late genes where it starts to produce its own tRNA yeah. that it a co that, it, that appears oh. in their genomes? I that's a re another really good question. Um, I'm gonna remember that, and I will get back to you. But yeah, that's a really that's a very good. I mean, the reality is I'm not a virologist, so I'm really kind of learning as I go. But um, those are the questions I really love. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you, everyone.